What is up guys? Welcome back to another video. Today we're going to be talking about what, what Linux is and what it can do for you, what it does for me, and in a nutshell, my experiences with Linux so far. Hopefully this will answer a lot of your questions too. So I've been using Linux for 25 years. I first got to use Linux when I was five. Back then it was like super do it yourself. Uh, there was not really much to do. You know, you could do basic things and uh, it, my experiences from there just went on. I kept using it and using as much as I could. And when I had a computer, I had it. When I didn't, I didn't. We were using hard drives back then, so things were not as quick when opening applications as they are now, like instant freaking taneous. So it was kind of a waiting process for some things. Dial up, uh, you know, ICQ. It, Linux was just different back then. It's hard to explain. I did eventually end up using Ubuntu. Uh, the last version I used fully, like a day-to-day -day basis, was 0904 because after that, Ubuntu became the most horrible freaking unstable mess imaginable. They stopped innovating, they stopped doing anything for the average user and started focusing on other things. So there's that. And I started jumping into Fedora and Arch Linux at that point because they were the superior option. I settled on Arch for the longest time and now we're here on Fedora and this is my my distro of choice as it were what linux is to me is a blank canvas okay that's what it is today and everything that i put in linux as a in, in a nutshell my theme my icons the terminal of choice my wallpaper the applications that i choose to install my kernel my distro choice all of this is me painting a picture of what i want out of linux and that is it's a really hard thing to do for me to personally describe my linux in a nutshell but gaming content creation video editing photo editing photoshop uh basically doing videos on really cool apps and stuff it, it helps define a part of you if that makes sense because everybody has a different version of linux sure we're all running the same desktop uh environment mostly a desktop environment does not define who you are because you know they all look the same in the beginning it's how they end up looking in the end that's that's you defining yourself what theme you use all of it and sure you could do that on windows but it can't exactly use kde or gnome or xfce or cutefish on windows that's just not a thing so to truly understand Linux, you kind of got to know where it comes from. I want you to do me a favor. If you're new to Linux, tell me what you think Linux is, okay? Do you think Linux is this terminal? Most people do. Do you think Linux is this desktop environment? Some people think that too. It's weird. Or do you know what, you know, real Linux users know that this, this kernel right here, this is Linux. Believe it or not, this is Linux. If you want to run Linux, you could run this from busybox basically and just have the kernel plus the shell there's programs like on raid which are headless which don't have any graphics acceleration that act like virtual machines that use slackware the great great granddaddy of linux uh that pretty much allow you to run any operating system you want and put in your real hardware and in a nutshell you you end up having everything you want it's really cool or do you think Linux is compiling things? Do you think you need to compile everything for Linux? Let me disperse those myths real quick. Say I want Steam. Done. I want Lutris. Done. Uh, Mango HUD. Done. It's simple and easy to do, okay? Linux is not compiling things anymore unless you're on Gen 2 and you're a complete psychopath. Yeah, then you're going to want to compile everything. You're going to have to compile most things. Uh, then you got the granddaddy of all operating systems, Slackware, which again, you're going to need to compile most applications if they don't already have it in a repo. And then there's uh, Linux from scratch, which is an absolute nightmare beyond that of Gen 2, which is hilarious. And then there's, you know, Nix OS, which is kind of like Arch Linux in a sense, except more in depth and basically all 10 nix users enjoy their lives and they will remind you more than an arch linux user that nix os is the coolest love those guys those guys are hilarious yeah like the myth that you need to install a billion friggin things to get steam to work and function for gaming install steam go to settings go to compatibility click a button hit restart done yay i can game on linux now or say if you want to run Ubi Connect, this button. You want to run EA app, click this button. You want to run uh, the Blizzard app, click this button. Search. 
and type Battle.net. Or at least it should show up. Yeah, it's right there. See? So you can play World of Warcraft, Overwatch, a bunch of other things. Uh, it's that simple, right? There are certain complications to things like with EA games. Sometimes they'll have EAC. Ubisoft Connect games. Uh, the Division 2 has EAC, but it works. Uh, e Anti-cheat's sort of a problem when it comes to Linux because, well, developers are not really that intelligent enough to understand that Linux does not give you a um, better opportunity to cheat than Windows does. It actually gives you less, less of an opportunity to cheat, right? And I know that may sound surprising to the people hearing that, but here's the thing. Um, getting a cheat program to work in Linux is, it could be a little, more, a little bit more difficult, right? Because that cheat program might not work at all with Wine because it requires advanced things to function. And if it doesn't, then, well, cheating's going to happen less on Linux. Not to mention that injecting things in Linux can, well, injecting things on Linux into Wine can have adverse effects. Uh, things don't behave very well. Things don't function very well in a nutshell. And things can get very problematic. By the way, this is an example of gaming if you want, right? Hopefully that bug doesn't happen. Ah, uh, there's a person up here. God damn it. I'm gonna hit you. Gotcha. All right, you're gonna do it. He's gonna do it. Watch this. Which way are you going? Where'd he go? All right, so now that Far Cry 5 is done crashing, I guess we can move on to desktop environments. Now, desktop environments completely depend on you as a person and what you want out of them. Uh, this is one of them. I don't think this is an up-to-date, but this is what a desktop environment used to look like way back in the day. It's kind of interesting. This is KDE Plasma 5, by the looks of it. Not a very good picture, but I did the best I could. This is a version of Deepin. This is another version of Deepin, which most people would probably find uh, pretty attractive and kind of fun to use. This is a more Windows-like experience, uh, like Windows XP, is what it is. And then, of course, we have GNOME, which is what I use. A whole bunch of stuff. Let me show you what it actually looks like before I got to it. Turn this off. And this is it. Honestly, I like it a little bit better this way, but I also like having good workflow. Your desktop environment, the way that you want to make it, all depends on you. So most people will tell you that GNOME can't be customized as well as, let's say, KDE or anything else. That is untrue. They just don't know very much about GNOME to get it done. They think that it's been, you have to take an hour to get things the way you want them in GNOME. No. Applications have changed that. Things like uh, Extension Manager right here. This application allows you to go browse for all the extensions that you want and need. And pretty much you can get something like what I have up and running in less than two minutes. If you know what you're looking for. And I've done it many, many times before. Theming GNOME, on the other hand, is another story. There are themes like White Sir right here that allow you to install and override what is called LibWeta. So you can pretty much have the look that I do. And there are people out there that call this ugly, but I guess they haven't looked in the mirror lately. Because if anything, this is what GNOME looks like by default. As you can see, it's not enabled because they don't have the funkiness. So if I actually wanted to enable this, I'm going to go projects, then I'm going to go to CD white, sir. And then I'm going to do install dash L. And this is going to install it. So now when I open up this, you can see that it has the buttons and it's a little rounder. It's a little more sleeker. Honestly, it looks a lot better than the default gnome. All right. Okay. Desktop environments again. The two big ones are KDE and GNOME. KDE is more Windows-like, but it has way too many features, way too many options, way too many settings. And I know for most people that could be a good thing, but it could overwhelm you. Where GNOME is more organized. Here's your settings panel. Everything is basically organized into place. Want to set your default apps there's your default apps like it has 
the right design method going on. And I enjoy how clean it is, how organized it is. I know a lot of people don't, and that's your choice. That's the thing. This is your painted canvas, all right? And this is mine. And with me, this works out a lot better than anything with KDE. Now, I want to talk about some of the advantages for emulation, because I know I have that audience as well. Uh, this is the normal 6.9 stock kernel. We hit 80 FPS pretty much in this scenario. And uh, this is with a custom kernel. I know I was standing right there, but that's 120 FPS nonetheless still. But right now we're at 137 FPS standing where we are. This is the difference between a custom kernel, like the Cache OS kernel, and the stock kernel. Stupid, I didn't take a picture in the same place. Same thing goes for Windows. Let me go grab those images. So this example again is with Rage Inks. On Windows, standing here, I had 50 FPS. As you can see right here, this is the performance. And that same exact position with the Cache OS kernel on Fedora 40, I had 60 FPS. And I like how Windows Mario, uh, Mario's eyes are closed. He's like, yep, we're the boss. And this pretty much entailed my journey because the 555 drivers were out and I wanted to go to Linux and it allowed me to do so. So some of the advantages are better performance depending on your system, like CPU, CPU heavy intensive situations. Linux is going to perform so much better because it's optimized for it with what are called uh, schedulers. And Linux just handles CPU. It's always handled it better. An example was the game Nier um, for our PCS3. It ran better on Linux than it did on Windows until they managed to fix that issue within the emulator itself by using a different scheduler. And I was the one that found this out. I'm going to go and try to find the video real quick. It happened a long time ago on my AMD system. So it's been a while. I don't even know how to spell it. Is it this? Uh, full speed, Windows 10. I think it's... Yeah, it's this one. Oh, that was such a horrible thumbnail, but I was lazy back then. Alright, let's hit play on this, if we can. Can we? Or is it so old that it does not let me hit play? So, yeah. Full 30 FPS. We're at a time where in Windows, it wouldn't let me until 2018. And, uh... When was this video? 2017. So here we are. Full speed in Linux. Which is pretty impressive for the time. And there's that weird little kid. And I'm over here fighting all these creatures. So this is was one of the advantages way back when. And I believe I'm still on GNOME. I just can't tell. Oh, I'm on Antragos Linux. So yes, I was on GNOME. I could tell by the A up in the corner. What resolution was this? It was only 720p. Yeah. This is pretty cool, isn't it? I like keeping my old videos for this specific reason. So let's close this out. And let's go fast forward to 2018. And we're running at 36. This is when I uncap the frames per second. Back then, our PCS3 did not perform very well. But nonetheless, it finally got to full speed on Windows because they made a whole bunch of changes. And this was all thanks to Linux. So once again, the advantages of Linux, the CPU intensive tasks like this, mean nothing to it. So it just crushes it very simple and easy. I never really liked this game. It was weird. 
Had a lot of fan service in it though, didn't it? All right. Well, I guess on to the next section. Where we talk about uh, practical, uh, some, some, some things you can do on Linux besides gaming. So for me, the things that I do on Linux besides gaming, uh, Photoshop, DaVinci's Resolve, record, I stream, I listen to music. Uh, I actually learn a lot of things. I discover new applications. I like how I'm spamming all of this. So yeah, Software Center, if you want to find apps or you find to find out what you already have installed and remove it. Like, if I needed to, I could go through here and remove whatever application I needed that I didn't want, like Kitty, because, well, it's kind of pointless. I don't use it. And I believe there's other ones in here as well. I don't know what you are. You're a launcher, though. Minecraft Bedrock's here. That's a thing. There's just, uh, I really like this. This works for me. This is Cider 2. It's a... Apple Music application. So it allows you to just have your Apple Music if you need it. There's my music. For DaVinci's, for video editing, this is DaVinci's Resolve. If you're using Caden Live, just imagine doing your work about ooh, 50 times faster and rendering out your work about 100 times faster. That's this in a nutshell. This is Hollywood level video editing software on Linux. Beautiful. It's fast, it's efficient, it has tons of really cool stuff, and more coming in the next version. Now, I had Photoshop already open, but it was getting in the way. It tends to always want attention and be up front. Uh, Adobe changed the policies recently, as of yesterday, where they basically can snoop on your work. But, yeah. In a nutshell, this is what I use for all of my thumbnails and stuff. I have a workflow in here. So, see that? That's pretty cool. Adobe Photoshop, if you want to learn how to install it, I have a thing in my Discord about that, so there's that. There's, there's no, there's nothing you could really use as a Adobe Photoshop alternative on Linux. The closest thing is Krita, and I know the developers don't want it to be thought of as such, but... It's the closest thing we have. Ugh. I get a headache every time someone tells me that because I know. But here's the thing. Applications throughout history have been used for things that they are not designed for. Get over it. Move on from it. And live life a little easier. Okay? Okay. Also, there's Affinity Designer too. It is what it is. But I'm going to cut the video here. Now, the last thing I am going to say is if you want to get started with Linux, the easiest way to do so is my channel, honestly. Uh, if I go to playlists, you can see that I have a bunch of playlists and stuff. But the ones that I've created is Linux Guide. All right. So if I come here, you can see I have a ton of videos to help you get started in Linux. And more are going to be added very soon as well. So this allows you to jump right in. Uh, how to make a bootable USB. How to create your own Arch Linux distro. How to theme Plasma 6. How to make the ultimate gaming version of Fedora 40 or 39. How to theme it is in here as well. DaVinci's Resolve fixes. How to use Heroic Game Launcher beginning with Steam. And so much more. It's all here. Anyway, don't forget to subscribe and like the video and share the video. Uh, let me go about your experiences. Remember, when learning Linux, the thing you need to have most is patience, the ability to read and just understand, take notes, uh, make a note. What does Linux, what, what do I need from Linux? What games do I play? Things like that. You make a list, you check it twice, you make sure things are being naughty or nice. It works. Anyway, I'll see you guys next time. Bye.